Hello viewers, welcome back to part three of the Oliver OC46 crawler steering clutch replacement fiasco. I attempted to film this intro about eight o'clock last night. That was a bad idea, so I'm gonna start it over. Here's the machine. I haven't done a whole lot to it. I did remove a little bit of sheet metal up here. I'll explain that in a minute. But before I do that, I think I better clean up some of this mess because the Bangladesh shipbreaking yard effect is uh, it, it's wearing on me. So I'll be right back. Well, that's moderately better. Don't worry about that stuff. We'll talk about that stuff later. It goes along with that stuff. Let's start with the good news. I got a whole box full of bearings and seals. There's our needle thrust bearings for the steering clutches. The big oil seals for those bowl gears. Got a tube of Loctite 515 flange sealant, the big tube, and a whole tube of Permatex Ultra Gray. I haven't decided yet if we're gonna make gaskets or if we're just gonna use the silicone and glue them together. When I took it apart, it was about 50-50. I think everything that had been taken apart before had been put together with just silicone. The stuff that was original obviously had gaskets. It's gonna be very tedious to make all the gaskets, so I'm kinda of leaning towards just, yeah, taking the easy way out. All right, that's it for good news. Let's move on to the bad news. This is the original ring gear and center carrier out of the steering clutch unit that we pulled out of the machine. It has some damage right here on these gear teeth. This is what goes inside of the discs for that multi-disc clutch. So my theory or thought was just to take the one off of the donor. This gear right here unbolts and it kind of, you know, you can press it off and press it onto the new one. Problem is there's three dowel pins in here. One, two, three. Those are reamed in place. So you have to press the thing on, bolt it up, and then run a reamer through here. These are 7 16 dowel pins. This one has three 7 16 pins. This one has two 7 16 pins and one half inch pin. So again, we could overcome that. We could ream them all out to 5 8 or whatever. You know, it's not the end of the world. But there's also damage to this ring gear. Let's see if the camera will focus, but yeah, there's quite a bit of pitting there on the teeth. And I'd say it's pitted right through the case hardened layer. So that's not good. So my preference would be to use the whole ring gear center carrier unit out of the parts machine. The problem is this pinion gear. We can't mix and match a ring and pinion. They're, they're a matched set. So I'm not 100% sure how these were made, but it's usually some variation of they put them on a, the ring and pinion on a fixture and roll them together, check the rolling contact, and you know they kind of mix and match them until they get a good contact pattern or in some cases they actually lap them together they'll put lapping compound on the teeth and run them under a load and they'll actually kind of wear into each other and make a, a better contact pattern anyway it's a bad idea to mix and match it can be done you know especially on a tractor it's a low speed application you know it doesn't really matter if it makes a lot of noise it's just we don't want premature wear which leads us to our next problem which is the pinion gear here, the pinion shaft. It's supposed to have eight to 10 pounds, inch pounds of rolling drag. Instead, it has about 20 thousandths of end play. So that's not good. And the only way to fix that is to take the front part of the transmission apart and tighten up the nut that sets the preload. But, you know, it didn't get loose on its own. These bearings are probably worn out. But guess what? we have an entire spare transmission out of the parts machine. And this is the last time I can use my, but guess what? This is the, the very last piece that's left from that parts machine. But I think the pinion preload and everything is good on this transmission. So what I think we're gonna do is yank the old transmission out and we'll stick the whole parts, transmission, steering clutch, differential, the whole shebang into this machine. Looks pretty good inside. There is a little bit of wear on this gear right here, which is the reverse gear, but this machine has an actual reversing gearbox, so 
it probably isn't an issue because the reverse gear and the transmission won't get used. So it looks pretty straightforward to pull the transmission out. There's a couple of big bolts there and there, and then all the studs have to come out. There's a short little drive shaft up here we have to split, and then the whole thing scoots out the back end. Also, in the last video, I mentioned that one of the parts machine final drives had gotten water in it. I started to clean up the parts, and it's they're not salvageable. These gears are all rusted. The teeth are all pitted. Yeah, we cannot use that. Which is a bummer because it had a really good seal surface right there. But yeah, the, the pitting on the teeth is it's pretty severe. Same thing on the pinion gear here. The, the pitting on the teeth is pretty bad. But the shaft itself is good and this seal surface on the shaft is good. So this gear actually presses off of the shaft. So we're probably going to reuse the axle shaft but we'll have to use the, the gear set out of the original machine. I'll we'll get ready to pull the transmission out. Ran into a couple little snags. This stud right here will not come out. You got all the other ones. And then this bolt right here, these must be special bolts. They have a one inch hex, which is really odd. Anyway, I finally got it broken loose. I just had to get out the big daddy three quarter drive breaker bar. As far as the stud goes, it actually comes through into the inside of the transmission housing, so I'm just going to heat up that boss right there and see if I can get it to come loose. Okay. I win. <laughs> Had a guy just go ballistic on the comments the other day because I used a pair of side cutters to remove a cotter pin. Apparently that's a no-no. Only done it a few thousand times. Works pretty good. He wasn't happy about it. This little Astro 1828 impact. She's pretty mean. Got a real bite to it. These aren't really, it's not really a U-joint. I think there's just a, a rubber bushing in here. So it's more like a flex coupling.
Maybe that was it. Ah. Yeah, simple as that. How does anybody live without a torch? Well, there should be shims underneath this cover. There's one. Two. Three. This is the fuel door off my wife's Toyota RAV4. Apparently it flew off while she was driving down the highway. Now that part doesn't surprise me at all. What does surprise me is that, number one, she noticed it, and number two, she actually stopped and picked it up. Anyway, she's got a whole video over on her channel where she tells the story. I'll put a link in the description. You guys can check that out, but I got a replacement. Let's go ahead and throw it on. I think that'll do. Sorry, the lighting doesn't get much worse than this. It's super early, still dark outside. Here's the OG fuel door. See the main hinge pin was broken. I think that's been broken for a long time. And then it finally just fatigued and broke this ear. And then whoosh, off it went on the highway. So, yeah, I couldn't think of a way to fix this thing. You know, we could try to weld that ear back on, but I don't know how to fix this hinge pin so this one came out of a junkyard somewhere on the east coast I just bought it on eBay and it's the same model year same paint color so it'll be close enough and it's perfect for people like me who are painting challenged pretty easy to change out just has these two big rivets just drilled those out and then it takes a pretty serious rivet gun to set these quarter inch rivets you're not going to do it with your little squeeze hand job so you need the one with the big long levers or a, a pneumatic one. So There we go. Mama's back on the road. Well, she's been on the road, but she's back in style. I tried it three times without heat and it pushed itself right out of the bearing splitter. Acetylene is the answer. This is the new bearing we're going to install. It's a 25580. The old bearing is a 25581. These are identical in width, diameter, load rating, etc. The only difference between them is this radius right here on the inside of the race. The 25580 has a 0.14 radius, the 25581 has a 0.03 radius. Now we're going to use the 25580 because it's readily available and it's also about a third of the price of the 25581. You know, plus this is a special order and who knows how long it's going to take to get it. 
I don't think there's going to be any problems. The bearing is fully supported along the inside and this shoulder right here that the bearing butts up against is a larger diameter than the radius so it's going to come out here onto the flat. I don't think it's going to cause a problem. Now there's other instances in the final drives I found where they use these special bearings with basically no radius. I don't know 100% why if that was more common back in the day when this thing was built or you know what the reasoning is. <laughs> she mowed half the yard so far. That's the probably the trickier half though. I did do the trickier half where there were fences and trees yeah. and drainage ditches and LP tanks. It happens. Right pup? Lunchtime? Lunchtime. We'll see if she runs over the stump that's out there. Yeah, between the lawnmower noise, the wind noise, and the poor lighting, this video should be pretty much unwatchable. Hashtag spite mower. Anyway, we're going to build up a steering clutch pack. I'll show you guys how to do that. I did one already, so I kind of have an idea of what's, what to do. So here's our outside basket. We're going to start with the Belleville washers. You're not supposed to mix and match these. Supposedly they were matched for the correct pressure. Now we are also not going to use this spacer. I've pretty much come to the conclusion that this is a homemade spacer that they use to shim the clutch pack out because it didn't have enough clutches to tighten it up. So we'll skip that. Well the first part's going to be this pressure plate. pressure plate goes on top of the Belleville washers and then you want to center these holes inside the notches that's where those rollers are going to go that actually disengage the clutch. Now at this point we can collapse the pressure plate and in the last part of the video I used the hydraulic press to push the pressure plate down so I could get the snap ring out. That's not going to work here we have to be able to adjust the tension on the clutch pack by adding and removing shims and also when we put these friction discs inside the clutch pack all of the gear teeth here have to be lined up so what we're going to have to do is actually put it <clears throat> we'll drop the whole clutch pack over top of this hub that has the gear teeth on it and that's going to line everything up but we have to have the clutch the pressure plate collapsed while we do that so anyway long story short I had to make some pullers there's a factory service tool and there's a picture of it in the manual I couldn't really tell from the picture how exactly it was made but I just took some 7 16 bolts cut the heads off and then bent them over and they will fit into the holes where the rollers attach and then I'm just using some strap clamps out of a clamping kit for a milling machine Set it up like so with some spacers, tighten it down, and it'll collapse the pressure plate. So I'll go ahead and do that. I'll bring you back. All right, it's pretty sketchy, especially that one, but it does work. And what I found with the other ones, you just have to basically collapse it as far as it will go, as tight as you can get it. All right, now we can install our friction materials. So we go friction, steel, friction, 
steel. So there's no real rhyme or reason to this. You know, they don't have to go back in the same order they came out. The only thing the book says is that if you have steels that are cupped, to make sure that the cup points the same direction on all of them. And I went through and checked these already. They're all pretty flat, so shouldn't need to worry. And we're going to soak this in oil before we install it, so it's not a big deal. And then this is the top pressure plate. There it is. So what I found worked well on the other clutch pack was two of these thick ones. They're about 32, 33 thousandths thick. We'll shove those in there first. It's kind of a pain because the shims are actually a little bit too big to fit past the snap ring groove. And then one thin one, this one's about seven thousandths. Okay, this one would not take the 7,000 shim. Couldn't get the snap ring in with it in there, so that's as close as we're gonna get without adding a shim underneath the Belleville washers like what they did before. So, it is what it is. I'm just gonna line up the teeth. Who came up with this system? How could they possibly put these together on a, on a production basis? Doesn't make sense. What I'm measuring here is the inside surface of that Belleville washer. If you don't know, a Belleville washer is basically a spring. It's a disc of steel that has kind of a conical shape to it and the inside diameter wants to spring away from the outside diameter. And you can stack them together, you know, back to back or face to face. And it's just like stacking springs either in parallel or in series. Well, anyway, the spec is supposed to be no more than five thousandths from the inside to the outside. And I've got about ten thousandths on this one. But I can't shim it anymore. So that's what it's gonna have to what it's gonna have to stay. It's as good as we can do. Okay, now we can install this bronze thrust ring and then the cam ring, like so. And then the cam rollers. So this, this cam ring should be free. That was a problem we had when we took the old clutches apart. It was actually bound up. So the, that means it wasn't putting the full spring pressure on the clutch plates. Now that our clutch packs are assembled, we can go ahead and assemble them to the center carrier. And there's a needle thrust bearing on each one. So it's going to have a race. Then a thrust bearing. And then a race. Just like so. And curiously, the needle thrust bearing is a Koyo, which is a Japanese company, but this was made in the USA. And the races are Ina, which I believe is a German company, but also made in the USA. So the book says to use a little bit of grease to kind of lubricate things and then hold them in place. So we'll stick a little grease on this race. Now 
That'll work. And we'll grease this guy up. There it is. This is kind of a poor design. You see there's six places around here where they've drilled a hole through. Three of them are for bolts and three of them are for alignment pins. This is actually a separate piece from the outside bell. Anyway, the result is that there's th six spots where about half the width of that bearing race is not supported. And it's only a uh, 1 32nd of an inch thick. It's about 32 thousandths thick. And I think that's why we found two of these bearing races that were broken. Now, why it only happened on the right hand side, I can't explain. But yeah, that's not the, not the greatest way to do that. We'll stick a little bit of grease on these needle thrust bearings here as well. So functionally the clutch packs are identical. Bearings have been replaced anyway, so it doesn't really matter which one we put where. I don't think. And I think these welds are factory. Both of them were that way. And the book says to weld it in three places after setting the rivets. So, yeah, kind of crude, but that's how they do it. Now, we do want to make sure we line up the rollers as much as possible, like so. supposed to wire the two halves together just so it doesn't get all squirrely on us trying to put it back together. I'll check it out. I did find one of these cam rollers that was actually cracked. So it's got six good ones in it now. We've got a complete steering clutch ready to go back in the transmission. All right, guys, it's about as far as I can go this week. I'm waiting on parts. I ended up pulling the input shaft out of the transmission. It's supposed to have three to five thousands of end play. It had about thirty-five thousands end play. So I want to replace the two bearings that support that. They're just deep groove ball bearings. So we'll replace those, replace the seal, and then I need a speedy sleeve for this bowl gear. That's on the right side, final drive, because the donor part was so rusty, we can't use it. And this groove is just way too deep for the seal to ever survive. So that stuff should be here next week. Hopefully, if everything goes well, we can get the thing put back together and try it out, but no promises. So it'll probably be kind of a short video, and I'll see you guys next time. What's going to happen is you're going to make all these people jealous that don't live within driving distance of Wisconsin. Well, if anyone is, like, I've already gone through a six-pack and I need more. <laughs> I had to make do with a boring old spotted cow. Hmm. Oh, well. You want to tell YouTube about how much school sucks? School is wonderful and amazing. Everyone should become a teacher. <laughs> That's what she was just telling me. <laughs> I was. Just telling you all about it.